B. Collins. Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's Thursday, November 12th, 2020. Trump and his allies know that he has lost to Joe Biden. But they continue to feed bullshit to their bobblehead followers. And it is stunning to me just how suggestible members of the Trump cult are. He tweets, they believe. Videos surface that don't prove anything, and they say, look, this election was rigged. And one of the big promoters of the bullshit for bobbleheads is a guy named James O'Keefe. And we talked about him a week or ten days ago and played one of his videos, which is used by Trump allies to support notions that the election was stolen and that there are all kinds of people who were in on it. And so the latest that comes from O'Keefe and his so-called Project Veritas is based in the Philadelphia suburb of Elkins Park. And we do not see the individual who makes the claims that you're about to hear, and his voice has been seriously altered. But we are told to believe that this is a postal worker, a brave USPS insider, who says that pro-Trump and pro-Republican mail is being discarded, while Biden mail is to be treated as first class. Now, even in the video itself, it provides information that proves that this is bullshit. Because the date that they cite is after the deadline for the submission of mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania. (laughs) So this is much ado about nothing. And even more nothing (laughs) when you parse it and break it down carefully. Check this out. Your your letter carrier? Tell me what your boss told you on November 9th. We were told that the only political mail that will be delivered from now on will be um, that of the winner. Um Okay, November 9th, from now on. The deadline for mail-in ballots, as approved by the United States Supreme Court in Pennsylvania, was last Friday. So, if I may be so bold, this is obvious malarkey. Um, In this case, um, Joe Biden, other political mail from other um, sources and senators would be put into the uh, undeliverable bulk business mail bin for UBDM. Why did Walter Lee instruct postal workers to discard Trump and Republican mail as undeliverable. Um, I'm not sure if that came from higher up uh, of him. Did Wal- so, Walter Lee is apparently the supervisor in this uh, postal location. And O'Keefe asked this guy a leading question. And then the guy says, well, I don't know if it came from higher up or it came from him. So it... it doesn't prove anything. Walter Lee tell you to keep delivering Biden mail? All, all um, political mail um, for Biden was to be continued to be treated as first class and delivered the day as received. What happens to the undeliverable bulk business mail? Um, I believe it goes back to the plant, but you be, uh, undeliverable bulk business mail is it, essentially it's a step away from the garbage. Do you think that the United States Postal Service should be playing politics? No, I think that we're <laughs> a delivery service, and that's not really our place. But the Postmaster General, he can play politics, right? So this is just another lame effort that does not pass a fundamental test of smell or fact. And it's already gone viral. Thousands of people have seen it. They're passing it along to other bobbleheads who are just going to, oh, yeah, yeah, we know. We know what Trump says is true. And here is evidence. Now, yesterday we were talking about Richard Hopkins. He is the postal employee. I think he still has a job in Erie in far western Pennsylvania. And uh, (laughs) we understand that he completely recanted the allegations that he had made that a supervisor was tampering with mail-in ballots. 
But Hopkins has claimed that he has unrecanted. And so I don't know exactly what to make of this. I just want to be、uh, straight with you. I reported this yesterday, and it's not clear whether he is standing by his statements. But in any case, his claim apparently involves no more than 130 mail in ballots that arrived after Election Day in Erie, Pennsylvania. So, what we see is where there may be a whiff of a problem. <laughs> the Republicans, like vultures, swoop in and then magnify it and say, well, you know, one, one guy tried to register to vote for his dead mother. So, that means millions of people who are dead are having votes cast in their memory. And the Washington Post took a look at four more of these claims from Trump surrogates. A video appearing to show an election official destroying a vote for Trump racked up tens of thousands of views on Twitter and YouTube, viewed hundreds of thousands of times on Instagram, posted by several prominent conservatives. It was originally posted on TikTok. It shows a person appearing to be a poll worker sorting ballots. And he wants, when he comes to one for Donald J. Dumb Trump, the person rips it in half. Well, the Washington Post fact checker tracked it down. This came from a Facebook user named Dale Harrison. He's from Colorado. And he now says that it was a joke. And in order to debunk it, the fact checkers write No senior staffers who are tasked with hiring election workers recognize him. There is no paperwork、uh, for the required background check. Anyone who is associated with vote counting was issued a specialized lanyard. And in the video, Harrison is not wearing one. The office also said judges who work in vote processing don't wear yellow vests, and the location where the video was filmed does not match the El Paso County, Colorado clerk's office or any of their facilities. The signage does re resemble a space where Harrison has filmed other videos posted to his social media accounts. Then to the allegation of ballot stuffing in Philadelphia. Trump campaign director of Election Day operations Mike Roman wrote in a tweet, literally stuffing the ballot box in Philly. You're only allowed to deliver your own ballot to a drop box, trying to steal the election in broad daylight. Well, this video has been viewed more than 300,000 times,、uh, 300, times, and it shows a woman approaching a drop box in broad daylight. She pulls out a stack of papers, shuffles them, puts a ballot into the box. Then the camera is obscured by passing cars. They say it appears that she has placed at least two additional ballots in the box. So they immediately assume that that is some sort of fraud. But it is permissible for you to deposit a ballot of somebody else in your household or workplace. You're supposed to put signatures there as a witness to verify that it was handled in that manner. You're permitted to do this for older or infirm people who can't deliver their own ballot. <laughs> And so, again, this is innuendo applied to video footage of uncertain credibility. Then there's the case in Detroit. It all started with a red wagon and a white unmarked van. Shortly after filming the scene, a woman named Kelly Sorrell shared the video with Texas Scorecard, which describes itself as、uh, citizens keeping score. So Eric Trump retweeted the video, now published in a story for the Gateway Pundit. His tweet got over 40,000 retweets, 300,000 views. Trump wrote Watch, suitcases and coolers rolled into Detroit Voting Center at 4 a.m. Brought into secure counting area. Now, one version of this story included a red Ferrari that followed the white unmarked van to this,、uh, you know, sneaky delivery. 
Well, it turns out that it was a TV reporter and his camera crew who were loading equipment in because they were planning to be there all day and all night. So these are, these are so thin, and they don't prove anything. And they don't provide enough evidence to support the idea that the election should be invalidated or flipped in certain states where these allegations originate. Here's another case from Arizona. And this is the Republican Attorney General speaking, Mark Burnovich. He said on Fox Business last night, Joe Biden will win Arizona. There's no evidence. There are no facts that would lead anyone to believe that the election results would change. Neil Cavuto asked about recent disputes over voting currently being argued in Arizona, including one in which a Trump campaign attorney claimed to have evidence of votes in Maricopa County, that's Phoenix, that had been incorrectly rejected. Well, Brnovich dismissed the lawsuit that came from the Trump allies as inconsequential. He said, we are literally talking about less than 200 votes that are in question and doubt. So the reality is, even if it was possible that those votes flipped, those 200 votes, I don't think that will make a difference in Arizona just because Biden has at least a 10,000 vote lead. So it shows how desperate Team Trump is. And here we are more than a week after the election, six days after it was projected that Biden won the Electoral College. And they're still trying to concoct a cause of action that could lead to the courts and ultimately get Trump before his good pals at the heavily packed U.S. Supreme Court. And look how desperate this is, okay? Texas went to Trump by 650,000 votes. But its loony lieutenant governor, Dan Patrick, has dangled a million dollars in reward money. And just to <laughs> show you how cheap they are, it's $25,000 per claim that is proven. So, you know, just like a game show, they say, they say millions and millions of dollars in reward money. But you can only get twenty-five grand if you provide information that leads to a conviction. And so I, I assume that Dan Patrick is offering this reward to out, people outside of Texas. But even with a million dollars in $25,000 chunks, you're not going to get enough uh, reports of fraud to change the lead in a 650,000 gap. And if you did, you would be flipping the, the state of Texas to Biden. <laughs> and that just shows what a, a farce this is. I'll bet none of that money ever gets paid out. And Dan Patrick was a fool before this, and he remains a fool. Now the latest gambit, all right? And I got to pause for a minute to say that you, if you've listened to our recent interviews with Brad Friedman of Bradblog and Greg Pallast, they both uh, said that the voting machines that were purchased and implemented in this election in Georgia were not certified by the federal agency that's supposed to do that. And so there are issues with the Dominion Ballot marking devices, BMDs, that were used in this election in Georgia. They were also used in some counties in Michigan. And so Trump is desperately tweeting that Dominion is evil. Well, and they may be. <laughs> I, I believe it's a Canadian company. Uh, but when you look beyond the bluster in two Michigan counties that used the Dominion devices, the inaccuracies that were corrected were because of human errors, not software or hardware problems. Issues in three Georgia counties had different explanations. In one county, an apparent problem with Dominion software delayed officials' reporting of the vote tallies, but did not affect the actual vote count. And in two other counties, 
a different company's software slowed poll workers' ability to check in voters. So that means there were some delays in those counties. But Trump doesn't have any problem with people lining up for hours to vote. Those kinds of delays. So the contention is, according to Breitbart and Trump, that Dominion software was used to switch votes. Some people have even suggested that the company was doing the bidding of the Clintons. <laughs> and Rudy Giuliani said that he was in contact with whistleblowers from Dominion, though he did not provide evidence. And today, Trump shared on Twitter new baseless allegations that Dominion deleted and switched hundreds of thousands of votes intended to support him. And again, I want to point out that these uncertified Dominion machines, in my view, should not have been used. But I believe that <laughs> they are vulnerable to manipulation in favor of either side. And this is just a convenient, opportunistic way of, again, painting Donald Trump as a victim. So in another tweet, Trump shared a video of election workers in Los Angeles collecting valid mail-in ballots that were posted on or before Election Day from a ballot drop box. And keep in mind that Trump, you know, he, he lost in California by a margin of over 65 percent. And he wants to point at Los Angeles County. Well... The narrator on a video is heard questioning why the election results were called before the ballots were collected. <laughs> and it's because Trump never had a prayer in California. And so he was projected the winner on election night. Uh, let me let me put straighten that out. Biden was projected the winner in California on election night at 8.01 p.m. California time. I saw it on the screen. There was no mystery to that. So once again, they are trying to use misinformation, lies, and videos that don't match the actual facts of what occurred. And this latest tweet from Trump was seen 71,000 times, oh, it was retweeted 71,000 times. It was favorited more than 183,000 times. And the social media guys are once again on their heels trying to keep up with all the lies that are being put into circulation. Oh, and it turns out, according to BuzzFeed, that these claims about Dominion originate at the One America News Network. And that's the one that is uh, tight with Trump and their uh, reporter. What is her name? Sharon, C-H-A-R-O-N. Uh, she was the one who originated the report, Chanel Ryan. I, I, I don't know if it's Rion or Ryan, uh, R-I-O-N. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's where that particular pile of garbage originated. I want to thank Linda Lewis, who helps us every day with our COVID report. And she was browsing over at uh, the White House website. And discovered that on November 12th, Trump extended a state of national emergency with respect to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Now, I want to share this with you without adding alarmist elements to it, because this executive order has been signed and renewed by several presidents before Trump. And it appears that it expires every year in November, and it has to be re-upped. But given the state of affairs, with the mass purge at the Pentagon and the installation of Trump loyalists there, one of the likely concerns that we have to be vigilant about is that Trump will try to help his old buddy Bibi Netanyahu with some sort of an attack on Iran before Trump's time expires. And I, I wouldn't put it past him. 
As you know, my initial reaction to the sacking of Mark Esper was, well, this makes the Pentagon kind of in transition and weaker in any effort to launch a military attack against Iran or perhaps Venezuela. So just tuck that one into your sneakers and we'll see if it becomes relevant. I've linked to Brad Friedman's post at bradblog.com about the situation in Georgia. And as you know, Brad Raffin's perjure, as uh, Greg Palace calls him, is the Secretary of State, a Republican. He is under fire from the GOP Senate candidates who feel that he hasn't delivered for Trump, and they want Trump to deliver them their Senate seats, and so it's an unholy bargain. But Raffensperger has announced, in apparent violation of state law, that he is authorizing an audit, a recount, and a re-canvas in Georgia. Now, these are three different functions, and it's not even clear that they can be conducted simultaneously. So recount laws in Georgia only appear to allow the Secretary of State to call a recount in the event that there's evidence of fraud that could change the final results. He has offered no such evidence. Otherwise, if the margin of difference between the two leading candidates is half a percent or less, a candidate then can ask the Secretary for a recount. So far, neither candidate has made such a petition. The current margin is 0.28% and rising for Biden. Now, one reason is that a recount can't be petitioned until after the race has been certified, which is expected a week from tomorrow, November 20th. But earlier this year, Georgia announced a new pilot program for a post-election risk-limiting audit. This kind of audit in which hand counts of small randomly selected samples of ballots in a race are carried out to determine, supposedly with 95% scientific certainty, that the results reported by the computer tabulators accurately reflect voter intent. So in Georgia, Raffensperger had previously announced that the state's pilot program would be carried out on just one single race every two years, and until yesterday... It wasn't expected to be the presidential race this year. So, then, there is the issue of these ballot-marking devices made by Dominion. These new touchscreens print out a computer-marked ballot summary, supposedly to be reviewed by each voter at the end of the process. But they are 100% unverifiable after an election, Nobody can know if the summaries were reviewed or not by the voter. Studies show that most voters don't look at them. 93% don't notice when the computer has changed one of their votes. So a review of these ballots can't possibly confirm what the voter intended. And Brad continues, While election integrity folks have long been critical of Raffensperger, this week, many on the right have suddenly decided they're also now critical of Raffensperger's selection of the Dominion systems and his administration of the presidential election. And Brad notes, at the same time, millions of handmarked paper ballots were also cast in this year's election. That would be the mail-in ballots. A hand count of these under the process may or may not reveal errors in the tabulation. But presuming a solid chain of custody would help confirm the accuracy of those results, at least for the hand-marked ballots. And then Brad concludes, none of this, meanwhile, will change the ultimate results of the presidential election nationally. Even if the results in Georgia were somehow to uh, flip to Trump, Biden would still have more than enough electoral college votes, even without Georgia, to win the presidency. I think the real issue is the focus on the runoff on January 5th for the two Senate seats. And this does have a big potential impact on Biden because this will determine who controls the Senate. And if the Democrats manage to win both races, Biden and economists who are helping advise his campaign say that the, the Dems will try to push through a large stimulus plan 
along the lines of the $2.2 trillion package that's being promoted by Nancy Pelosi. Biden's uh, team is also developing a government employment program, the Public Health Job Corps, that would put 100,000 Americans to work on virus testing and contact tracing. But if the Republicans win one of those seats in Georgia or both, the agenda will be seriously stymied. Now, one of the issues that appears to be causing Republicans to kind of split the baby, they want to stay on board with Trump and pretend that the election isn't resolved. But the issue of whether Biden should be receiving CIA intelligence briefings has led many people to say, oh, sure. (laughs) And this does cause a bit of contradiction for Republicans who say, well, the election isn't settled. But, you know, Biden, he should have those briefings from the intelligence community. And one of the issues that's been raised by lefty media, MSNBC to be specific, is that uh, because of the delayed launch of briefings to George W. Bush in late 2000 as the election was hung up in Florida and then decided by the Supreme Court, he didn't start to get briefings until like December 15th. Then they linked that to the attacks of 9-11 and say, oh, well, <laughs> uh, that was caused by the delayed briefing of Bush. Now, I'm sorry, that, that just not fit the history at all. That is made up. Because the ignorance of the Bush administration was intentional. We know that Condoleezza Rice warned him on August 6th in 2001 that bin Laden was getting ready to do something big. And Georgie said, well, I I, got to go chop some more wood out here on the ranch. You take care of that, Condi, and get back to me. So Marco Rubio says that Biden should get briefing. Lindsey Graham, Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, John Thune, Ron Johnson, Chuck Grassley, those are all Republican senators who say they believe that uh, Trump should allow the briefings to go forward. But, of course, that's linked to the uh, General Services Administration, the $10 million bucks to fund the transition, <laughs> and we know that at least as of today, Trump's not ready for that to happen. So Republican Governor Mike DeWine of Ohio and good old Carl Rove, who published an op-ed in the uh, the, uh, Wall Street Journal yesterday, they were both saying, look, it is not statistically possible to turn this around, Don. And I quoted Rove last week. Here's the guy who was the architect of stolen elections for Bush in 2000 and 2004. And when he says the jig is up, (laughs) he also got paid by Brad Parscale some amount of money to be a consultant to the Trump campaign. Rove's article was entitled, This Election Result Won't Be Overturned, pointing out that recounts often change hundreds but seldom thousands of votes in a given election. The Democrats are raising concerns that this hang-up of the transition is putting more people at risk, and it's, it's a fair attack because Trump is not focusing on the pandemic at all. He's not responding to the rising rates of infection, the rising rates of hospitalization, And a death toll that is trending up to 1,500 a day now. And as he focuses only on himself, and of course he believes he's immune because he's been through the COVID. Well, Chicago is issuing a stay-at-home advisory. Anthony Fauci is saying he hopes to avoid lockdowns, but... This trend is spiraling out of control. And this has led Nancy Pelosi, who is in some ways embraced by the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, to continue to push for a larger bailout package, including money for states and cities, $1,200 checks, extension of unemployment benefits, more small, small business assistance, 
expanding access to testing. And Schumer, Chuck Schumer said, the longer Senate Republicans are playing this sad game is the longer they are denying families much needed relief from the COVID health and economic crisis. There is a looming deadline of December 11th when the current bill that funds the federal government will expire. And there has to be an agreement there to avoid a government shutdown. I don't think anybody really wants that. And perhaps that bill may be the package that includes the other bailout elements. And social media is having a hell of a time figuring out what to do with Trump in this post-election period. They had kind of gamed out the pre-election restrictions. And there has been outright censorship at... uh, social media outlets, but for the most part, they're using these lame tags and labels and they'll cover a tweet and then you can click on it and uncover it. They should just bounce this liar. He has so brazenly violated their standards and he continues to do it with these uh, uh, phony claims of election fraud. And so Twitter has softened the aggressive approach it took in the days after the election It labeled thousands of people uh, as uh, promoting information that could not be proven. And a spokesman said Twitter will continue to restrict the proliferation of tweets that get labeled and disable the retweet button indefinitely. But that's not the same as banning somebody who is intentionally misleading what he claims is 84 million followers. And Facebook has redirected its content moderation teams to focus on high-severity content with election-related content taking top priority. According to a memo from last week, it noted lower-severity takedown appeals and other tasks would be immediately closed out due to lack of bandwidth and the need to reduce significant backlog resulting from a spike in the amount of content that's in the review queue. And there have been calls from uh, Georgia to try to continue uh, filtering information but allowing political ads for this upcoming dual Senate runoff. And we learned that Facebook isn't able to turn on or turn off certain features, you know, like the feeding of advertisements on a state or county level. And that kind of surprises me. I I thought they had very uh, micro control of the distribution of various content on the Facebook platform. I want to recommend two opinion pieces today. Uh, the first from David Sirota, and in a moment we'll talk about Joe Laria's piece. But writing at The Guardian, Sirota says that the Democrats are being way too passive about Trump's you know, resistance. This article doesn't explicitly mention the million MAGA march called for Washington this Saturday. But I think that it's uh, something to be concerned about. And Sirota compares this to 2000 and says the Democrats haven't learned the lessons from 20 years ago. He says, this is a full-scale emergency, and yet the Democratic strategy seems to be to try to pretend it isn't happening in hopes that norms win out, even though nothing at all is normal. And with Trump and his allies filing these ridiculous lawsuits, Bill Barr's recent memo trying to generate, generate headlines as opposed to win legal cases, And he talks about a professor at Ohio State named Edward Foley who wrote a piece back in 2019 noting that legislatures could use the public perception of fraud to try to invoke their constitutional power to ignore the popular vote and choose the electors for the Electoral College themselves. And while I believe that this, you know, would be so far out of the norm that we treat it as unlikely or almost impossible. 
it appears to be one of the considerations contemplated in the Trump White House right now. It's complicated. You'd have to have enough states to flip the vote. And Trump is still shy, you know, somewhere around 60 electoral votes. But it is a possibility, and we must remain vigilant. And uh, I, I also heard from listener Ford Green, and his uh, impression is that the Democrats are too passive about the threats that are being posed right now. I do think they need to step up the game and uh, be more aggressive with Trump. And before I get to the next uh, op-ed piece, it's interesting because Paul L. Sesser, our listener who lives north of Sacramento in Durham, California, he uh, sent me a note that cites the David Sirota piece that I just uh, referred to. And he says to me, great reporting on Con Man Don and the election. Something I haven't heard you mention are the documentaries on HBO and Stars about Trump's mentor, Roy Cohn. The HBO film is Bully Coward Victim, and the Stars Encore piece is called Where's My Roy Cohn? And I actually have seen both of those, and I did a bit of a review on Where's My Roy Cohn? Uh, I do think that it's instructive about Cohn and some of the uh, lessons that Trump picked up. I was disappointed that Where's My Roy Cohn uh, didn't really bring it more into the present day. Uh, Elsesser goes on, more importantly, is Trump's strategy of lawsuits trying to overturn the election and his constant claims that election results are fraudulent, a public relations effort to prepare Republican state legislatures to not recognize the vote in their state and send it to their uh, to the House of Representatives. And uh, this is another issue because... The Democrats were focused so hard on the presidential race, the Senate, and to a lesser extent, the House of Representatives, that they once again, in a critical year, a zero year, that leads to the report of the census and the redistricting, the gerrymandering that Republicans will be conducting, that locks in their minority rule as a nominal majority for the next 10 fucking years, once again... We had uh, Eric Holder, the former attorney general, running some super PAC that was supposed to help uh, win legislative majorities to prevent gerrymandering. And almost nothing was gained. Also, a note from Abby McMillan in Maine. She's concerned, and Mike Malloy alerted her, her to this on a podcast recently that Trump is a classic security risk, that he knows all sorts of state secrets and he's a grifter, he's deeply in debt, he is a pathological narcissist. Uh, You're right about all this. And I heard this aired out on MSNBC the other night, the concern that he might try to sell or disclose state secrets in exchange for non-cash benefits. And Abby notes, the article points out the only saving thing is that he may not have been paying attention long enough to retain useful information. But, you know, uh, the fact that he doesn't read, he prefers television and video and graphic, he, he has a really good memory. And I think once he is told something, he, he doesn't easily uh, forget about it. So I do think that this is a potential issue, and it's something that we've known really since day one of his presidency. Now to the other commentary I'm I'm recommending today from my friend Joe Laria, the editor-in-chief at Consortium News. Let me quote his opening paragraphs. Republicans must know that Joe Biden got more votes in too many states and by too wide a margin for the 2020 election results to be overturned. Nevertheless, many Republican leaders are still backing Trump's claim that Biden's election was not legitimate. After the Democrats played the fabulous Russiagate card to undermine Trump's legitimacy, they should not be surprised by Republican efforts to undermine Biden's. This is U.S. politics in a downward spiral. 
And I think Joe makes a really good point here. He continues, the same way Trump laid the groundwork during the campaign by questioning the validity of mail-in voting, Hillary Clinton laid the groundwork during the 2016 campaign to undermine Trump by recklessly branding him a Putin puppet. That blossomed into four years of full-blown Russiagate, which was meant to question the validity of Trump's election, undermine his legitimacy, and hamper his ability to act as president. This is tit for tat for the Russiagate gambit. Put bluntly, this is what the Democrats get for starting all this. And he warns, don't be surprised if Fox and other Republican outlets gear up to question Biden's legitimacy for the next four years, the way Democratic media stirred up Russiagate madness for the previous four years. Russiagate may morph into Chinagate following stories of Hunter and Joe Biden's business deals in China, which partisan liberal media suppressed. So <laughs> I, I think Joe's on to something there. And... The problem is that Democrats put so much stock and faith into Russiagate and they didn't read the Mueller report. They just assumed it said what they thought it should. And this has led to the fundamental claim of fake news. There was fake news related to Russiagate. But then Trump and his supporters pile on all these other false claims of being victimized. And they can't separate the... Russia Gate, which you know has merit, from just about everything else that doesn't, and that's where we are, <laughs> and it's going to be a bumpy road forward. Well, I want to remind you that the Peter B. Collins podcast is heading into its final days here as your humble host prepares to retire. I'm going to wind down this daily news and comment by Thanksgiving. And I'll overrule that statement if uh, conditions require, if there is a coup or some protracted battle over the election outcome. But you can expect a series of final interviews. I'm lining up the guests for it right now, people who I've enjoyed the most over the years. I'm also going to be putting together a podcast or two with interviews with people like you who have listened and supported this podcast for up to 11 years. And then uh, starting in December sometime, I will repost some of my favorite past interviews. I want you to know that the website and the archives will remain online indefinitely. So I want to remind you again, if you've been a subscriber uh, in, and you were on the list during the month of October, don't worry, I've got your email address. If you were not active in October, please send me an email so I can include you on my alert list if and when I break silence, uh, probably next year sometime, and uh, start to bring you some occasional podcasts. And when you write me, please send tips about other podcasts or media outlets that you recommend. That's been the number one question from listeners who are uh, bemoaning my plans to, uh, to end my work here. And uh, finally, I just want to remind you, if you have an active PayPal order of any amount, I ask you to cancel it. I thank you for your support, but uh, I need to protect your interest. I am not able to cancel them from this side of the PayPal wall, and uh, I need to ask you to uh, cancel your payment order so that you don't get surprised when my robots pick your pocket. Well, interesting analysis of election turnout last week. It is currently rated at 64%. The projection when everything is counted will be about 66.5%. That is the highest ever. Oh, highest in over a century. I, I guess that's based on a percentage of the population. But as we have seen speculation about, we're getting more data to support the troubling notion that many of the areas that actually increased their support for Donald Trump and said, yeah, four more years of this shit is something that's really good for me and for our country. Well, BuzzFeed did a breakdown, and they found that uh, when you look at death rates by county and the surge in the unemployment rate triggered by the pandemic, those are areas where Trump support 
actually increased in the election. So Tom Frank is the guy who introduced us to what's the matter with Kansas and why people can be persuaded to vote against their self-interest. And there it is again. Recommend a piece by Ben Norton over at the Gray Zone Project today, where the term Gray Zone actually shows up. <laughs> this is the uh, coverage of a guy named uh, Richard Stengel. And Stengel once referred to himself as the chief propagandist over at the State Department. And he's now been picked to head the Joe Biden transition team for America's propaga uh, propaganda operations. That's the Voice of America and uh, Radio Marti and Radio Liberty. Uh, it's called the U.S. Agency for Global Media. And we have covered it this summer because it was uh, th there was a change of the guard. Trump installed one of his loyalists there who has shifted from, uh, you know, projecting broad American propaganda to just projecting Trump propaganda. And presumably Stengel will return to the previous standard where it won't be just uh, propaganda in service of the administration. But uh, Stengel boasted that he started the only entity in government that combated Russian disinformation. That was the Global Engagement Center at the Pentagon when he worked under Hillary Clinton he published a book this past June called Information Wars, How We Lost the Global Battle Against Disinformation and What We Can Do About It. Stengel has proposed rethinking the First Amendment. You know, it's not very convenient sometimes. He says, having once been almost a First Amendment absolutist, I've really moved my position on it because I just think for practical reasons we have to kind of rethink some of those things. So his selection means that he is on a fast track to be the guy who will be tapped to run the global media operation. He has spent time at the Atlantic Council. After leaving the State Department, he became an advisor to Snap, the company that runs Snapchat and Bitmoji. He's also worked closely with the fine folks at the Atlantic Council and their digital forensic research lab. And they're the, along with the uh, Atlantic Council, uh, they participate in the censorship operations at Facebook these days. But here comes where Gray Zone comes into the picture. Because in an event where uh, this article includes a video of uh, Richard Stengel, also with him is a political scientist named Kelly Greenhill, Hill. And she mourned the alternative media platforms that publish things that seem like they could be true. That's the sphere where it's particularly hard to debunk them. It's this gray region, this gray zone. It's a sort of gray propaganda, not black or not white. And Stengel approved by chiming in, by the way, those terms, the gray zone, are all from Russian active measures that they've been doing for a million years. The bad actors use journalistic object objectivity against us, and the Russians in particular are smart about this. So that's a Joe Biden pick. You can imagine how excited I am. Now, while we're talking about propaganda, one of the ideas that Trump has dangled in recent days, and I suppose he has to leave the White House to do this, so you might consider this to be an acceptable trade-off, but he is planning to launch his own media platform. Apparently there was discussion of a cable network, but that's too expensive. And there aren't really any cable channels that you could easily acquire that have distribution to lots of households. So, uh, and I imagine Steve Bannon has got to be a player in this if he can get out of his uh, legal jeopardy over the scam, scam, you know, raising money to build parts of the wall. But there's a lot of competition in this space. Bill O'Reilly is now doing a digital platform. The Blaze. What was that guy's name? <laughs> See, I've already forgotten. He was all over Glenn, Glenn, Glenn. He, he was all over Fox, and then they dropped him. Hmm, sorry. Uh, I, I have actually purged him from my... Uh, 
<laughs> my brain. Uh, there's Newsmax, there's Breitbart, there's uh, Parler, which is a Facebook for le- uh, for conservatives. And then there's Trump's favorite, the One America News Channel. But apparently he's so pissed at Fox over calling the Arizona numbers on election night and for referring to Biden as president-elect. <laughs> well, we'll see how all that plays out. There's also a lot of tension among Republicans. And some of them seem to be cheering Trump's uh, uh, apparent idea to fire the head of the CIA, bloody Gina Haspel. They want to uh, pay her back because the Ukraine impeachment whistleblower came from the CIA. Now, I doubt that she was uh, real pleased about that whole episode. And this is a difficult one for me, because I think it's silly to be purging people from the Pentagon, the intelligence community, when you're a lame duck president. I don't think that's good policy and, you know, it leads to instability that could lead to uh, opportunist attacks on our country. But Gina Haspel is so disqualified, not because she's a woman, because she is a bloodthirsty torturer. She never should have been promoted to CIA director to begin with. And Obama's efforts to suppress Dianne Feinstein's torture report that came out of the U.S. Senate, his failure to prosecute the obvious criminal behavior of leaders of the CIA in implementing the torture program under the Bush administration. That's what enabled Gina Haspel to become director of the CIA. And it was the spooks, of course, who we believe intervened in the original efforts to prosecute Jeffrey Epstein in Florida going back almost 20 years. And today, the Justice Department concluded their investigation into the guy who killed the Epstein investigation, former U.S. attorney in Florida, Alex Acosta, who became the labor secretary under Trump. And he resigned when the heat over Epstein got uh, just out of control. And he has been accused of poor judgment, but they exonerated him of professional misconduct when he basically just deep-sixed the case against Epstein, and he did uh, allude to uh, pressure from the feds because Epstein had uh, intelligence connections. And Whitney Webb did a great job of exposing those last year at Mint Press News. And one of the attorney f- attorneys for Epstein victims named Paul Cassell said that the uh, decision was in part based on their inability to find emails from May 2007 and May 2008 in that period when uh, Alex Acosta made his decision. And Castle said, this report is a cover-up. How can you possibly claim you've done a thorough investigation without exploring issues like interviewing Epstein's defense attorneys? And... The occasional uh, righteous, <laughs> occasionally righteous, Republican senator from Nebraska, Ben Sass, who's been critical of the department's handling of the Epstein matter, he said, letting a well-connected billionaire get away with child rape and international sex trafficking isn't poor judgment. It is a disgusting failure. Americans ought to be enraged. Jeffrey Epstein should be rotting behind bars today, but the Justice Department failed Epstein's victims at every turn. The Justice Department's crooked deal with Epstein effectively shut down investigations into his child sex trafficking ring and protected his co-conspirators in other states. Justice has not been served. Well said, Mr. Sassy Sass. Well, the... One country, two systems experiment in Hong Kong is over. And any aspirations for anything that remotely resembles democracy are dead. 
because the last remaining 15 pro-democracy lawmakers in the Legislative Council in Hong Kong have resigned as a group in protest over the Beijing crackdown that ousted four other pro-democracy legislators. And this is a, it's a difficult episode because I harbor some suspicions that the U.S., the CIA, that we were active in supporting some of the demonstrations. I support the demonstrators, but I think they may have been co-opted by the United States and perhaps other governments. And at the same time, I've been to Hong Kong twice. I don't claim to be an expert on the former British colony. But I honor the desire of its residents to be independent of Beijing's control and the long reach of the Chinese Communist Party. It's a sad day for Hong Kong. Here's today's COVID-19 update, prepared by Linda Lewis with my gratitude. Worldwide, we're at 52.5 million cases, 1.3 million deaths. Here in the United States, we crossed the 10 million case threshold. We had 144,000 new cases reported yesterday, up from 119, 120,000 the day before. Total U.S. deaths now at uh, an estimated 242,000. And yesterday, highest death toll in recent uh, memory, 1,893. And there were about 1,350 reported the day before. So the CDC has published new Thanksgiving guidance. And we're not going to have much fun at Thanksgiving this year. I put up a link in the show file for this podcast to the CDC protocols that have just been released. But they are observing that family gatherings are partly fueling the increase in cases. And Canada celebrated its Thanksgiving on October 12th, and they said clusters of new cases have been tied to family get-togethers. So they are recommending that you should celebrate with people in your household. If you're going to invite people from outside, everybody needs to wear a mask, bring your own food, drinks, plates, cups, and utensils, wear a mask except when you're eating and drinking, avoid going in and out of the kitchen, Use single-use options like salad dressing and packets, disposable items. I mean, what are we going to have, burgers? <laughs> no turkey allowed? If you're hosting a gathering, they advise that you have a small outdoor meal with family and friends, limit the number of guests, clean and disinfect frequently, make sure if you're indoors to open some windows. If sharing food, have one person serve the food and use the single-use options. And they're saying staying at home is the best way to protect yourself and others. Travel increases your chance of getting and spreading the virus. If you are traveling, CDC emphasizes checking travel restrictions, get a flu shot, wear a mask, distance, wash your hands. And state leaders have issued their own holiday guidance here in California. They're suggesting that resident limit, residents limit themselves to outdoor gatherings with people from no more than three households and limit the contact to no more than two hours. Rhode Island has urged residents to avoid travel for the holidays and decreased its uh, limit of people gathering from 15 to 10. Massachusetts advises short in-person visits and virtual holiday dinners with extended family and friends especially if they are in high-risk groups. And the state also issued new limits on gatherings at private residences, reducing the uh, maximum from 25 to 10. The latest to test positive from the super spreader White House, it was an illegal event, a political event held on public property on election night, Corey Lewandowski. He, of course, was, uh, he remains in Trump's advisor circle. He was nominally the campaign manager during the first stages of the 2016 run. And also, David Bossie, who is the Trump campaign advisor, who is supposed to be filing all these uh, frivolous lawsuits, he tested positive 
and he is uh, quarantined. Rachel Maddow's quarantined, too. I don't know if you know that. Uh, she came into contact, we're told, with somebody who uh, was uh, actively carrying the virus. Also, Linda is sharing from the Charlotte Observer the COVID-19 death rate in less crowded nursing homes in one part of Canada was less than half that of homes with shared bedrooms and bathrooms during the first months of this pandemic. The study conducted in Ontario, the province in Canada. This comes as U.S. nursing homes are seeing a spike in new cases, including a 120 percent rise in Midwestern states since mid-September. New weekly nursing home cases grew 43 percent from mid-September to the week of October 18, with uh, almost... uh, 1,200 nursing home deaths reported that week. The study we're referring to involved 618 Ontario nursing homes with 78,000 residents from March to May. Less crowded nursing homes reported death rates at 1.3%, while uh, basically uh, places where the rooms had four clients had a 2.7% rate. That's just about double. The probability of introducing COVID-19 into the nursing homes didn't differ according to crowding level, with 31% in crowded homes and 30% in less crowded facilities. But the outbreaks tended to be larger in the crowded ones, with nine outbreaks involving more than 100 residents in crowded homes versus only one in less crowded facilities. So it does show that there are uh, substantial measurable differences between various types of conditions in the nursing homes. An August study of the same nursing homes in Ontario by the same researchers found that for-profit facilities had higher rates of COVID than non-profit and municipal counterparts. wonder why. They say it's likely because most for-profit homes were built to older design standards, and, of course, they cut their costs wherever they can. Pfizer is responding to questions about, okay, you got a vaccine. Ninety-four people uh, got favorable results from it. That appears to be enough to win approval to roll this vaccine out. But as we have reported to you, it has to be stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius. That's minus 94 Fahrenheit. And apparently you can warm it up before you stick it in somebody's arm. I hope so. Because uh, for you to get uh, a jab with a needle that has a vaccine that is super cold, uh, what the hell is that going to do to your arm or wherever else they uh, shoot it into your body? So uh, we're told that it can survive for about a week when it's stored at uh, less extreme cold temperatures. But that's going to create a whole logistics issue. There are only so many freezers that go that far uh, into the the cold. And, uh, you know, they're not evenly distributed across the country. Then there's the transportation issue because uh, Pfizer is developing this in, uh, I think, in Belgium and in, uh, yeah, Poors, Belgium, and in Kalamazoo, Michigan. It also takes two doses. And so... Uh, there are challenges in terms of rolling out a vaccine, uh, putting aside the issues of whether it's been properly evaluated uh, before it is distributed to the public. Well, this is sad news in the ICE department. The Trump administration continues to try to deport several women who blew the whistle about being mistreated by a Georgia gynecologist at the detention center in Irwin County, Georgia. And there's one woman who was supposed to be on a plane back to her native country yesterday, but they pulled her off after someone intervened. And while we haven't seen solid evidence of the initial claim of widespread hysterectomies that were performed by this uh, Dr. Amin, There is broad evidence that he performed surgeries and other procedures on women who did not want them. And in some cases, uh, they felt coerced. And here's a tragic case, and I'm scratching my head because 
Here's a man who has been in prison in California for a couple of decades, and he's close to parole. So this summer, they allowed him to work on the inmate firefighter teams, and his name is Baunchan Kiola. He is originally from Laos. His parents took him from Laos when he was four years old. He spent the rest of his life in the United States. And he was nearly killed on the front lines of the Zog fire back in September. They didn't uh, give him very good health care. They returned him to prison. And as he faces his release date, Governor Gavin Newsom has declined to pardon him. And I double-checked before I uh, sat down to record today because Newsom issued 10 pardons earlier this week. But he declined to pardon Mr. Keola, who is about to be released from a California prison and will be immediately handed to the custody of ICE to be deported to Laos. He's made a plea that he'd like to visit with his parents before he is deported. And let's not count on that. Barack Obama has his uh, part one of a memoir that clocks in at 750 pages. <laughs> 768, volume one. And one of the key takeaways, reporters are a little bit hard-pressed to speed read this, is that, uh, number one, he said that Americans were spooked by a black man in the White House, and he believes that that Racial anxiety led to the rise of Trump. He said it was as if my very presence in the White House had triggered a deep-seated panic, a sense that the natural order had been disrupted, which is exactly what Trump understood when he started peddling assertions that I had not been born in the United States and was thus an illegitimate president. Obama recalls his first presidential election, the fight over the Obamacare uh, Affordable Care Act. He says the rise of Sarah Palin helped fan the flames of the Tea Party, leading to Trumpism. He also details two surprising offers of help that came from Trump while Obama was in the White House, one to help plug the Deepwater Horizon oil well that was spewing in the Gulf of Mexico back in 2010. What was Donald going to do about that? Put a hotel over it? <laughs> and he also offered to build a pavilion on the White House lawn. What a great guy. And in the book, Obama confirms what was uh, somewhat danced around during the campaign recently, that Joe Biden did advise Obama not to approve the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. Quote, Joe weighed in against the raid. During the group discussion, Biden said that uh, he told Obama, don't go. He's also said subsequently he told him to follow his instincts. And Obama wrote, as had been true in every major decision I'd made as president, I appreciated Joe's willingness to buck the prevailing mood, ask tough questions, often in the interest of giving me the space I needed for my own internal deliberations. Well, Jeffrey Tubin has become the first victim of Zoom onanism. Yes, the incident where he was on a Zoom call with people from the New Yorker and the public radio station in New York City, where he thought that he had muted both his camera and the audio, and he proceeded to drop his drawers and pleasure himself. Well, Condi Ness, the owner of the New Yorker, has sacked him after 27 years on its staff. And I have to say, I really have mixed feelings about this. I don't think that masturbation is a crime. It's deeply embarrassing. And you got to ask, you know, when he first was visible to the other parties on this conference video, why didn't somebody call him on his phone and say, Jeff, you're jacking off in front of us. And so it goes. And finally today, we have disturbing news to the producers of the Hamilton musical. Because a new study indicates that Alexander Hamilton 
was a slave owner. And the world's gonna know your name. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton. And there's a million things I haven't done. But just you wait. Just you wait. An historian has just published a research paper saying not only did Alexander Hamilton enslave people, but his involvement in the institution of slavery was essential to his identity, both personally and professionally. Whoa. It is vital that the myth of Hamilton as the abolitionist founding father end. As odious and immoral a thing is the name of her report. And her name is um, Jesse Serfilippi. And the biographer of Hamilton, Ron Chernow, says, well, this is terrific research, but he questioned her claim that slavery was essential to his identity. Chernow noted Hamilton's work with the Manumission Society to abolish slavery in New York and defend free blacks when slave masters from out of state tried to snatch them off the streets of New York. And we'll let Hamilton play out the show today with my gratitude to listener Billy Cook from Eureka, California, because he gave me two tickets to go see Hamilton. And I'm never going to forget that, Billy. Thank you very much.